Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Taylor. I'm here to talk to you about uh, the wrongful conviction of Mr. James Richardson. Now, James Richardson was convicted in 2011 in a Greenville, North Carolina, Pitt County courthouse of double homicide. Now, these double homicides happened uh, at a nightclub in 2000, June 30th, 2009, in downtown Greenville, North Carolina, uh, called The Other Place, in which uh, during the incident, the shootings, uh, two people uh, lost their lives. Uh, a ECU, ECU, uh, ECU, East Carolina University student, Edgar Landon Blackley, uh, a senior, was killed also. Uh, a restaurant, local restaurant manager, Charles Andrew Kirby, uh, was killed in those shootings, unfortunately. Uh, and within a few hours, uh, police uh, had warrants for Mr. James Richardson uh, for the murder of those two gentlemen. Now, a little bit about Mr. Richardson at that time. Uh, he was a Greenville. Uh, he, he originated uh, from Greenville, uh, North Carolina. He was a uh, standout high school basketball star at Greenville Rose, who had went on to play uh, in college and also professionally overseas. And at that time, uh, James Richardson was visiting uh, Greenville, North Carolina, where, uh, unfortunately, he was at the bar with an incident. An altercation took place uh, where he was involved in an altercation. However, um, after the altercation, uh, someone uh, drove by the nightclub in a white BMW and fired shots into the crowd. And those shots uh, eventually killed uh, Mr. Blackley and Mr. Kirby. And uh, because James Richardson was the most well-known individual at the club, I think, uh, this is why he uh, was eventually charged and convicted of the murders. Now, since that time, uh, Mr. Richardson has maintained his innocence, and I have had the pleasure of speaking with Mr. Richardson, also with his mother, his fiance, as well as several people who are involved in the case. And uh, these people have given me privy information about certain inconsistencies that show his innocence, as well as some uh, prosecutorial misconduct, uh, some withholding of evidence, uh, some witness pressuring and coercion, and also some jury uh, bullying. So I'm gonna give you a few facts about this case and uh, hopefully you guys can share this information and we can bring an innocent man home to his family. Now, uh, the first inconsistencies of this case is about uh, what happened during the shooting. Now, prosecutors allege that Mr. Richardson solely drove by the club in this white BMW, reached across the passenger side of the vehicle and let off shots, therefore killing the individuals. Now, uh, the thing about this is this account, this prosecutorial account, conflicts eyewitness testimony uh, of what happened in uh, the shooting. Now, I'm going to go over about four eyewitnesses accounts. Now, uh, one of the eyewitnesses for the prosecution claims that she saw Mr. Richardson, who was wearing, uh, and everybody can agree to this, uh, on both sides, he was wearing a white t-shirt, some red balling shorts, some sandals, uh, and some socks. So she said that she saw Mr. Richardson after the altercation, uh, walk to his car, uh, well, not his car, the white BMW, uh, go to the trunk, cock the gun back, get back in the car, screaming some expletives, and then she said that she saw that same car with Mr. Richardson in it, drive by the club and fire shots. However, uh, this eyewitness testimony who was so detailed about Mr. Richardson and what happened when asked to pick out Mr. Richardson out of a police lineup, she picked the wrong man, which once again discredits everything that she said she saw during that time. Now, another witness, uh, and this witness is actually the roommate of one of the deceased men said, he says he saw James Richardson uh, get in the car, 
uh, scream some ep- expletives and drive the car away. And then it was then after uh, the shooting uh, that he heard gunshots. Now, uh, this <laughs> man also uh, said that the shooter, which he alleges was Mr. Richardson, uh, wore dark pants and he was dark skin. Now, as you see from the photo on the thumbnail, once again, James Richardson is a six foot seven, uh, light skinned black male with short hair. Now, once again, this witness's account uh, differs from what uh, Mr. Richardson wore, as well as his physical appearance. Now, also, this witness only came forth after seeing Mr. Richardson's picture on the news. So, once again, that has a very disturbing connotation is because he couldn't uh, he he identified the shooter as a dark skinned man with long pants but as soon as he saw the picture on the news uh, once again he was sure uh, as his words state that it was Mr. Richardson now one of the, the most disturbing witness uh, a one Mr. Vital Thorpe now Mr. Thorpe was found only two weeks before the trial was to begin. Now, he was the only eyewitness who was certain that it was Mr. Richardson. Now, what's most disturbing and, you know, sticks out like a sore thumb or raises a red flag, whatever connotation you want to use is, Mr. Thorpe was the Little League soccer coach of one of the assistant district attorneys of the Pitt County Courthouse, Greenville Courthouse office, Mrs. Kimberly Robb. This mysterious eyewitness that appeared 20 months after the shooting happens to be the Little League soccer coach of one of the uh, district attorneys in the city. Now, this, uh, uh, this Mr. Vital thought would later contradict and recant his testimony saying that you know the judge and the prosecutor pressured him into seeing uh into saying what he said in which he later recanted said okay only thing i saw was an arm leaning out the window and um this once again just shows about the uh prosecutorial uh pressuring of witnesses during this trial. Now, also, uh, there were two eyewitnesses for the defense. One, Nicholas Golden, and one, Mr. Brian Richardson. Now, Nicholas Golden said that he saw a black man hanging out of the window up to his rib cage or his torso. And also, he stated that uh, the man was accompanied in the car by two or three more people, which contradicts uh, the uh, prosecution story of James being alone in the car. Also, uh, this witness said that uh, what he told police did not match what he saw. And the reason is because when he made his statement, he said that the police wanted him to back up everything else that everyone else was saying that James was the shooter. Now, also, the other guy, Brian Richardson, once again contradicts uh, the prosecution's account that the shooter, once again, was dark-skinned. And he also had that, sh- that said that the shooter had on a black or red hat with sunglasses, in which a couple of other, other eyewitnesses said for the prosecution. So here we have, once again, contradictory testimony about five accounts of you know, five people telling different stories. So that should raise uh, one red flag. But also, um, another uh, inconsistency is jury deliberation. Now, on the first day of deliberation, uh, the vote came back nine, four, and three against. That means nine for guilty and three for not guilty. Now, after three days, um, Two of those who were holding out, you know, caving under pressure, but one still uh, held true to his belief of Mr. Richardson's innocence. And on that day, the jury foreman handed the judge a note saying, hey, we want this guy removed from the case because he can't make a decision. 
So at, at that prompting, the judge, he admonished the jurors that, hey, you don't have to, you know, cave under pressure of your peers, but you have a responsibility to make a judgment speedily. So what did uh, the lone juror do? The next day he caved and voted guilty. Now this juror, Mr. Lemuel Anderson, would later admit that he felt pressured by his counterparts. And also uh, he said that he really could not see the images on the video that the prosecution showed. And we're gonna to get to that video in a minute, but Mr. Anderson said that he uh, you know, felt bullied and, and actually regrets that he didn't stand on his square when pressured. And he said, you know, a lot of the evidence, uh, he couldn't really tell what he was saying on that video. And he still to this day uh, regrets that he voted to convict Mr. Richardson. Now, another juror, once again, also black, said that she felt bullied as well. And she made the statement that most of the juries, jurors were already ready to vote not guilty as soon as they entered the deliberation room. And once again, this, this, this lady said the same thing. She did not know what she was looking at. A lot of the information was conflicted and something was just not right. So we have two jurors who later recanted their vote and said that they were pressured uh, by their counterparts and also the judge saying that, you know, they has to make a speedy decision. Now also, uh, I left this out. Um, speaking of Mr. Richardson being uh, the only shooter, see the only person in the car, there was gunshot residue found on the passenger side door handle and also the passenger side's window, but there was no gunshot residue on the steering wheel. So if someone would have fired a gun from that position, gunshot residue would have been on their hands and also uh, would have been on the steering wheel. So once again, that leads uh, credence to eyewitness testimony that the shooter was in the, um, in the passenger seat. And also there were no shell casings found in the car. So if Mr. Richardson was leaning over and, you know, barely out the window with a gun, the shell casings would have been dropped inside the car, but there were no shell casings found inside the car, which leads me to believe that the passenger uh, really was sh shooting because there was no way that Mr. Richardson can drive a car and put his whole torso out of the passenger side of the vehicle. Now, the most damning evidence is that video footage that jurors saw. Now, one thing about this video footage is it was not clear. And actually, uh, the defendant's lawyer now, uh, his motion for appropriate relief lawyer, Ms. Heather Radelaide, uncovered documents that noted that the video was not in its original format when jurors saw it, meaning that the vi video... The, the, the images and the still images, most importantly, that jurors saw were actually lower quality than what they should have been shown. shown. Now, the lower quality video does not even show other images, other images that were in the back seat and in the passenger seat that could have alerted jurors to the fact that other people were in their car and it was not um, as the prosecution said it was. Now, the prosecution knew that this video was not in its original form. However, they did not disclose this fact to the jury or the defense. Because of the work of Ms. Redley pouring over thousands of pages of documents, she uncovered that SBI report saying that the video was not in, in its original form and also it had been doctored. So that in itself is evidence of prosecu prosecutorial misconduct, t uh, evidence tampering, and the like. So those are just a few of the um, details of this case that warrant that Mr. Richardson uh, should be uh, granted appropriate relief because of all of these uh, conflicting testimonies, 
uh, eyewitness pressuring, uh, juror bullying or tampering, all of these things, granted, admit to, um, you know, foul play in this prosecution. Now, if anybody knows me, they already know that I've interviewed a one Mr. Montoya Dante Sharp, who was just recently released from Greenville, uh, from a Greenville courtroom of murder that he served 25 years for. Now, this this murder was similar. Uh, there there was a white person killed, and uh, as Mr. Mr. Sharp told me that they said, well, as soon as that happened, the black people in the town was, somebody's going to pay for this. That's what they were saying. And of course, unfortunately, Mr. Montoya Sharp had to pay for it. The, the prosecutor, once again, knew that he didn't had nothing to do with it. They went off the eyewitness testimony of a 15-year-old girl who recanted weeks later, and they still kept that man in jail for 25 years because they did not want to admit that they did anything wrong, but also they didn't want to uh, give up that conviction. And also, I interviewed a Mr. Cedric or Tyrone Barrett, who was also charged with two murders around the same time Dante Sharp was, and he once again was railroaded by the system. The police knew that, that he didn't do it. Fortunately for him, uh, he got found not guilty on one, and he was granted a, a mistrial on the other. But this goes to show that there's a history in the Greenville Pitt County uh, court arena that overly prosecute these cases, these high profile cases, when there is uh, a a need or a cry for justice in, 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 in high profile murder. So I am sharing this video and I hope you will share this video to bring light uh, to Mr. Richardson in his case. Uh, also, I do want to call out one Ferris Dixon, who is the present district attorney uh, in Greenville, who ran on the campaign of conviction integrity. He said he would form a conviction integrity unit that has not been formed yet. Uh, we have been knocking on his door. We have been presenting himself with this evidence. And he has yet to address this situation because we all know that prosecutors who uh are promoted on the basis of conviction, rarely want to admit wrongdoing. And actually the prosecutor, I think his name was Everett, uh, continues to deny any wrongdoing uh, and uh, will not admit of, of the, the video tampering and also the witness tampering uh, that happened in this case. So I'm, I'm, I'm asking uh, you guys to sign that petition on www.change.org free James Richardson. I'm going to post that uh, in the link as well and also share this video and if you guys know any advocacy groups that are advocating for issues like James and others uh, we ask you to to share this video with them let people get involved because as one who has been falsely accused myself and face spending the rest of my life in prison I am very passionate about these itching issues fortunately for myself I came out on the right side of justice where I was found not guilty of all of those charges. But I know that there are several individuals who, like myself, who have been falsely accused and are falsely incarcerated for things that they didn't do. So I hope you guys will share this video uh, to help bring James home to his loving family, uh, his loving friends, and, his, and the people who have been advocating for the past 11 years uh, for a man who has been falsely and wrongfully convicted. We thank you. For, for sharing this video. We thank you for tuning in and uh, we hope that this video sheds light on uh, some, some, some cases, some injustice, but also bring other cases to light as well. Uh, we thank y'all. Y'all have a blessed day.